All right, we still have a few people trickling in, but we are ready to get started again. Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us tonight for updates from the Family Heart Foundation advances in the homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia or HOFH. I'm really excited to see you all here tonight. Just a quick medical disclaimer that this uh, webinar is for your information tonight. It's not intended to be medical advice. Um, and of course, you should follow up with your doctor and your medical team pertaining to your treatment uh, following tonight's webinar. Um, I'm honored to be here tonight to co-host with Dr. Mary McGowan. Uh, before we get into the webinar, I want to share a little bit about myself and a few housekeeping items um, in case you're wondering who I am and why I'm here tonight. Um, as I said, very, very excited to be here. My name is Allison Jamison. I'm a board member for the Family Heart Foundation, um, but I'm also a patient who's living with homozygous FH. And um, it means a tremendous amount to me to be here on rare disease, in honor of Rare Disease Day to share more about this um, condition with everyone from patients to family members to healthcare providers and others. So I want to share, like I said, a little bit about my story because it may be familiar to some of you that I've met before. To those I have not, it may resonate with your experience. But I've known from a young age that I had FH, but did not know that it was homozygous FH. So I was actually diagnosed when I was five years old. Um, I had developed these lesions on my skin that were ultimately determined to be xanthomas. And my father had had a heart attack when he was 28. So my parents knew that cholesterol was somehow involved. And I am the middle of three children. So my parents did have all three of us tested. My brother and sister had total cholesterols above 300 and mine was closer to 850. So we knew something was going on. We knew that mine was somehow different, but at the time my diagnosis was simply severe FH. And that's kind of what we operated on for the next couple of decades, honestly. Um, and I was fortunate to be able to begin treatment young, but again, didn't really know what the diagnosis was, why my experience was so different from my siblings. And it was not until I was 35 years old after I had had two separate bypass surgeries an aortic valve replacement and a heart attack at 35 that I was actually diagnosed as homozygous FH. Um, it made a huge difference, I think, to me and my entire family because now we understood why my experience was different. Um, we understood why I didn't respond the same way my brother and sister did. And it gave me a real sense of peace to, to have this diagnosis. And that's why I think diagnosis is important. The diagnosis also opened up doors for me. I actually got the official diagnosis when I joined a clinical trial. You know, I had reached this point in my life where I'd asked my physician, what else can I do? And he had found a clinical trial for me. And so I was able to participate um, and have actually been in multiple clinical trials since then and feeling like this is really a way for me to take control of this and to contribute in some way to this community. So that was huge for me and it was huge for my family. It was at that time as well that I found the Family Heart Foundation and for the first time in my life met other people with FH that I wasn't related to uh, and met people who were living with homozygous FH. I'd never met anyone like that before and all of a sudden I had this entire community of support and understanding and it was a real difference maker in my life. And um, it's the reason that I became involved with the group and the reason that I became involved with the board. And I think it's a really exciting time in this field, especially from a patient perspective, um, as I've seen over the last several years, increases in treatments available and things like that. I have results that I never would have thought possible. My parents would never have believed possible where going from a total cholesterol of 850 to today on combination therapy, my LDL, is 56. My total cholesterol is right around 100. It is really, really um, amazing and a fantastic time to be um, being able to take advantage of all of these wonderful um, drugs and treatments that are available to us. So that's why I'm here tonight. Um, and I'm excited for you to get to hear from Dr. McGowan. Um, and so I'm going to go through a little bit of, like I said, some housekeeping items. I see some of you are already in the chat, which is great. So you can see the chat function at the bottom. Would love for you to put in your name and where you are and whatever you might like to share with the group tonight. Make sure that you do select to everyone so that we can all see you. If it's just hosts and panelists, it will just come to myself and Dr. McGowan. 
We're also going to have opportunity for Q&A today. So that's the other option you'll see at the bottom of your screen in addition to chat is the Q&A. So you can put questions in there. We'll be able then to keep track of them and make sure we get questions answered. Dr. McGowan is going to leave us, lead us through a great presentation. And then I'm going to help sort of aggregate the questions that we received and ask those to her at the end of today's session. So if you've got questions as they come up, feel free to put them in there and make sure you're using the Q&A there. We'd also like to thank our sponsors tonight, our HOFH community program sponsors, Regeneron and Amrit, as well as our uh, Family Heart partners. Um, appreciate your support as always and excited to, um, to recognize them tonight as well. So without further ado then, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Mary McGowan, who's the Chief Medical Officer of the Family Heart Foundation. Um, she is an expert on the subject. She's a wonderful person and I have had a great honor to work with her for my time on the board with Family Heart. So Dr. McGowan, thank you so much. I'll let you take it from here. Thank you very much, Allison. Um, it's great to hear your story and it's amazing, you know, for all that you've gone through, um, you keep so upbeat and, um, it, your LDL is fantastic. Um, and I, 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 it makes me so happy to hear. Um, so today we're going to talk about finding and treating homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. Next slide. I'd just like to um, talk about a little bit um, about um, uh, the Family Heart Foundation's public comment letter to the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force, um, where we focused on HOFH. Um, the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force wanted to dismiss HOFH, which we'll talk about, um, but we made it front and center. And um, we'll talk about what homozygous FH is and how it's inherited, why um, the diagnosis is often missed, and that results in delayed treatment and often early cardiovascular events. We'll talk about what we've learned from our um, two major data assets, the Cascade FH Registry, for which we're now publishing a paper on HOFH, or hopefully publishing a paper on HOFH has been submitted. And we'll talk about the Family Heart Database, which we also have queried in terms of HOFH. And then we'll talk about treatment goals and options for treating HOFH, including agents that are in clinical trials. Um, so the next slide. So what I'm going to talk about right now is a story, um, and it really dates back to 2006. Um, but the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force, many of you may not know about them, um, but I'd like to tell you about them. And they're, they're a very powerful voice um, in um, prevention in the United States, uh, where they, they opine on multiple um, issues. Uh, cholesterol in children, hypertension in children, um, how often you should get a mammogram, and uh, you know, the list goes on, um, but they're not really experts. And so we'll, we'll talk about that. And so when we talk about that US Preventive Service Task Force, uh, our comment letter to them, we're really advocating for you. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about the, the background. When I said the US Preventive Service Task Force, um, they comment um, and make recommendations um, when we should be doing preventive screening in the United States. And one of the things that they've um, made recommendations on are the benefits and harms of screening for lipid disorders in children and adolescents. And in 2007, and in 2016, the US Preventive Service Task Force released recommendations on lipid screening in children and adolescents. And what they said was there is insufficient evidence to assess the balance of benefits and harms for screening for lipid disorders in children and adolescents. So they gave it this I designation, insufficient evidence. And then in January of this year, the US Preventive Service Task Force once again signaled that they had reviewed the evidence. I mean, we had you know, commented um, in uh, June of 2021, suggesting things that they should look at when they make this determination. Um, they once again signaled that they were getting, uh, giving it an eye. Um, this is despite the fact that the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends universal screening in children. So does the NIH. Next slide. So um, universal screening, is recommended, but it's seldom done. And in large part, we believe it's not done due to confusion caused by the US Preventive Service Task Force's I designation. 
Um, but what does the American Academy of Pediatrics recommend? And what does the NIH recommend? They recommend all children should be screened between the ages of nine and 11, and again, between the ages of 17 and 21. Children with a family member with FH or a family history of heart disease should be screened at age two. Um, and that is really crucial. So screening at age two, but if that doesn't happen, at least screening between nine and 11. And the primary rationale for screening early is to identify children with FH and initiate treatment. Next slide. So um, the uh, US Preventive Service Task Force is actually funded um, by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. And this group describes the US Preventive Service Task Force as follows. They say, the US Preventive Service Task Force works to improve the health of people nationwide by making evidence-based recommendations on effective ways to pre prevent disease and prolong life, prevent disease and prolong life. And so it was interesting, you know, as I knew this was gonna be coming up, um, I happened to see a piece, a perspective piece in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, which is a well-regarded journal, obviously. And it noted that the research researchers who coined the term evidence-based medicine, so the US Preventive Service Task Force is working on evidence-based recommendations. And the researchers who coined the term evidence-based medicine stressed that this doesn't represent cookbook medicine, but rather an educated blend of the best available evidence. That's only one piece of it, one third of it. Blend of the best available evidence, clinical expertise, expertise from people um, who treat um, individuals with homozygous FH, with heterozygous FH, and very importantly, patient values. What do people with familial hypercholesterolemia value? What do, would they want? And you know, when we speak to people with FH, often they say, I wish I knew, knew earlier that I had this. I wish I knew earlier so I could participate in a clinical trial so I could um, get my children screened. Um, and the list goes on. Next slide. Um, so the current draft recommendation, um, so this is what the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force is putting out to the world. They say homozygous FH is outside the scope of this review. And that was what I, I, I just found it so egregious. How could it possibly be outside um, the scope of their review? Homozygous FH is, is the uh, most serious form of FH. And so Pediatric lipid screening can identify children with HOFH who frequently have no physical findings um, and whose parents may have undiagnosed FH or even undiagnosed hyperlipidemia. And one of the reasons we do the Cascade Registry is so we can bring evidence to the fore. We can really find out how often do children with HOFH um, not have physical findings. And I, I would say that the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force, I think because they're not experts in FH, they have a sense that if a child with HOFH walks into a doctor's office, they are immediately going to know that they have HOFH. And some people, some HOFH children do not have physical findings. And even when they do, and I know some people on this call tonight have kids who have been diagnosed with molluscum contagiosum when what they really have is xanthomas. Um, so a full 44% of children in, our, in the registry don't have physical findings. And if we could just go to the next slide and then come back to this one. So these are some of the physical findings that some of you know all too well. Um, on the left-hand side are xanthomas and they're on, you can see these xanthomas in people with um, multiple different skin tones. The Achilles tendon, as you can see in the um, slide and the, the left lower, um, that Achilles tendon is very thickened and it's thickened with cholesterol and it makes the tendon much more likely to rupture. And I've had several orthopedists who have um, diagnosed um, FH by uh, Achilles tendon xanthomas when they, when they rupture. Um, xanthelasmas around the eyes and corneal arcus. And I can tell you that not a single child in the HOFH registry or in our registry with HOFH had corneal arcus. Um, so if we can go back to the previous slide. 
So the diagnosis of HOFH only requires a simple blood test. But if we are saying um, there's insufficient evidence to recommend screening, um, we're not gonna get that blood test. LDL levels in children with HOFH are four to 10 times the recommended level. So it's not subtle. Um, you know, it, it, it doesn't mean that the pediatrician should have to be able to know how to treat HOFH, but they should be able to say, this is abnormal, I need to consult somebody. The best way um, to identify children with HOFH is early screening of at-risk children and universal pediatric lipid screening would be the next best thing. So it would be best to screen it too, but if there's not a family history or they don't know the family history, at least screening between nine and 11. And so our letter to the US Preventive Service Task Force said with you know, all of this in mind, how on earth can HOFH be outside the scope of their review? Next slide. And next slide. Um, so HOFH, as you know, occurs in one in 300,000 individuals. And although the diagnosis may occur in childhood, without universal screening, this is often not the case. Many people in our registry um, are not diagnosed until adulthood. And we bring this information to the US Preventive Service Task Force. And when they're diagnosed in adulthood, it's generally in the setting of an acute um, event, an atherosclerotic cardiovascular event. In the Cascade FH registry, the oldest age of diagnosis in a genetically confirmed HOFH patient was 37. So not unlike Allison, who was diagnosed at 35, but this patient in our registry um, didn't have the benefit of knowing um, about their risk in, until um, they had a, an event. Um, if universal screening were the norm, this person who wasn't diagnosed till 37 would have been identified at the latest between nine and 11, instead of nearly three de decades later in the setting of an acute cardiac event. Next slide. So the untreated LDL of children with HOFH in our Cascade FH registry is 776 milligrams per deciliter. And so these are the children, those enrolled as adults, most diagnosed as adults, it's 533. So what this points to is that only children with the most severe HOFH are being diagnosed early. That leaves the rest of these kids um, to be identified as adults, often in the setting of an acute event. So in our letter to the US Preventive Service Task Force, um, we said your mandate to prevent disease and prolong life should be extended to the most vulnerable FH patients, those people with HOFH. We also noted that there are medications um, that are approved exclusively for children and adults with HOFH. And these agents, on top of everything else people are on, can lower the LDL an additional 50%. And so allowing many people to be like Allison, get their LDL into the goal range. Um, I mean, a, an LDL of 56 is, is enviable for anyone. And many patients, um, as I said, would be able to get to these guideline recommended LDL levels, but only if they're diagnosed and treated. Next slide. So this is the, um, we uh, published this abstract um, and uh, I don't expect you to read it all. It's, a, it's a very dense, um, but we'll go to the next slide where, um, uh, it, and then we'll, we'll come back to, um, the table in the registry. But one of the things that we asked, um, we asked people um, who had been impacted uh, by HOFH to sign our letter. And um, Allison Jameson um, signed it and uh, pointed out that she has HOFH diagnosed at 35, following two cardiac bypass surgeries, a heart attack and an aortic valve replacement. Kate and Dave Robinson, who have been huge supporters of the Family Heart Foundation, um, they both have heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, but they did not know it until they had two children diagnosed with HOFH and one child with HEFH. And their, their child who was diagnosed at five, um, he, again, diagnosed with molluscum instead of xanthomas. And uh, by the time he was finally diagnosed, um, he had a right coronary artery blockage of 90%. 
and Kate and Dave um, were, you know, adults. They were parents of three um, by the time they knew their diagnosis. Um, we have um, Francis Emelo from New Jersey, diagnosed at 26. Maddie Dabas, um, diagnosed at 26. Jessica Moy, um, more the appropriate, um, diagnosed at, at six. Um, we have three Jessicas here. Jessica, uh, and I think all spelt, oh, oh no, two, two spelt the same way. Jessica Nussbaum um, from uh, Nebraska uh, with um, a, an HOFH diagnosis at 38 and Jessica Fikes um, diagnosed at 36 um, when her child had uh, was diagnosed with HOFH. So these kinds of things need to be brought to the attention of the US Preventive Service Task Force or they will not change um, their, their mind. Next slide. So our letter um, was signed by 115 people and families impacted by FH, HEFH, HOFH, um, as well as people living with elevated lipoprotein little a, who, as you know, often go undiagnosed due to lack of screening as well. Our letter was signed by 65 healthcare providers who are experts in FH. And although we weren't seeking to get other major organizations to sign on, they suddenly started knocking on our door. The American Heart Association came to us and said, can we sign on? We saw a draft of your letter. The American College of Cardiology and the National Lipid Association among and seven other groups. So we hope the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force will change their I designation. But you can be sure if they don't, we will not stop pushing for universal screening and early diagnosis of both HOFH and HEFH. Next slide. So how is homozygous FH um, diagnosed and how is it inherited? Next slide. So these are the four known genes. Um, and, and I would step back to say, um, sometimes people who have HOFH level um, LDL, um, when we do genetic testing, are not found to have, they may be found to have one mutation, but they may not be found to have two, or they may not be found to have any. So we do treat the lipid levels. Um, but the, the major genes, um, and as you can say, see here, the LDL receptor gene, the ApoB gene, PCSK9, and something called the LDL receptor adapter protein one. And so the little Y-shaped um, receptor is um, present and we're depicting a liver cell. That's the LDL receptor. If the LDL receptor is, um, is not functioning properly, um, it will not be able to um, have, it will not be able to recognize the LDL. Um, the LDL in this picture is the little yellow ball with an a, um, orange ribbon around it. That orange ribbon is ApoB. So what ends up happening if um, the LDL receptor is uh, malformed or mutated, um, LDL builds up in the, in the bloodstream and gets into the artery wall. Um, the ApoB mutation, um, ApoB, the little orange ribbon around the um, LDL, is how the LDL is recognized by the LDL receptor. So even if you have a completely normal LDL receptor, if your ApoB isn't functioning properly, the LDL receptor won't be able to recognize it. And then the PCSK9 is that brightly colored protein um, that is uh, pictured on the surface of the LDL receptor. And that protein was really discovered not so long ago. Um, and it is the, um, PCSK9 protein, proprotein convertase subtilisin texan type 9. And that protein um, actually latches on to the LDL LDL receptor complex and it drags that LDL LDL receptor complex inside the cell, but targets it for destruction. And so that means that the LDL receptor can't recycle. Normally, an LDL receptor can be thought of as a chaperone. It brings the LDL cholesterol into the cell and drops it off. And it makes about 100 to 125 trips in its lifetime. But if PCSK9 latches on, then um, the uh, LDL um, receptor can't um, continue its job. And as a result, you have fewer LDL receptors and LDL builds up in the bloodstream and into the artery wall. And finally, that LDL receptor adapter protein one, 
Um, that is uh, depicted as that little green oval. And it allows um, the LDL receptor to be in the right position in the cell. And, um, and if it's not um, functioning properly, that LDL receptor doesn't, uh, isn't positioned properly and so doesn't interact with the LDL sufficiently. If you have homozygous FH, you have two mutations. You might have two LDL receptor mutations or an LDL receptor mutation and an ApoB mutation or any, any um, combination thereof. Next slide. So there are two forms of familial hypercholesterolemia and tonight we're focused on HOFH. HEFH is much more common and it occurs in about one in 250. It involves only one uh, inherited one abnormal gene. For HOFH, two abnormal genes, LDL is generally greater than 400 milligrams per deciliter. And in fact, it can be as high as 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams per deciliter, depending on what mutation you have. We see the onset of cardiovascular disease in the past um, in childhood. And unfortunately in our registry, we still see the onset. Um, we've seen many people with an onset early, um, but with new medications and with these medications being able to be used earlier, um, we are really hopeful. So most respond to these new medications. We know that other medicines like statins, azetamide, PCSK9 inhibitors, most people with HOFH, although they respond to these agents, they don't respond as vigorously as people with HEFH. And HOFH is rare. It's about one in 300,000 people. Next slide. Um, this is um, HOFH scientific criteria. So we can diagnose HOFH by doing genetic testing or um, by um, clinical criteria. And so clinical criteria it generally is that you have an LDL uh, greater than 400. Um, you have two parents um, that have um, HEFH or they have very high um, cholesterol. And um, you can have these physical findings that I showed you earlier. Um, genetic testing, next slide, should be offered um, to individuals with suspected FH, whether it be HEFH or HOFH, um, but it, it, you don't have to have genetic testing to make the diagnosis, but it is um, certainly uh, available and should be, should be um, offered. Next slide. And so why do we want to treat um, elevated cholesterol. We want to treat elevated cholesterol to prevent the development of atherosclerosis. And atherosclerosis can occur in any arteries in the body. Um, so it can occur in the heart arteries. It can occur in arteries um, to the brain, which can um, lead to stroke. Um, we know specifically people with HOFH are quite prone to aortic valve stenosis. And um, we know that uh, the um, lipid can get inside the, the valves and the valves can become calcific and, um, and require as Allison had an aortic valve replacement. And then even in the, the lower extremities, we can see um, atherosclerosis. So the sooner somebody gets treated with lipid lowering agents, um, the more likely they are to keep their arteries in the normal, um, the normal state, as you can see in the far left. Next slide. So why is HOFH diagnosis missed and treatment delayed? Next slide. So there are lots of reasons. Um, there are conflicting recommendations around screening and you'd be surprised how this really influences people. Um, because the American Academy of Pediatrics and the, this is the National Heart Lung Blood Institute, which is part of the NIH, they recommend universal screening. But because the US Preventive Service Task Force does not, um, that some way um, allows certain um, people, certain physicians, certain clinicians say, well, it can't be that important if the US Preventive Service Task Force isn't recommending it. If they're saying, we don't think, you know, we, we don't know, we think there's insufficient evidence. So, so it doesn't get done. Um, and even if screening takes place, a lot of times healthcare providers fail to connect the dots. Um, healthcare providers think HO, FH is so rare that they will never see it. And then when they do, there's a failure to recognize it. 
Um, and they think that all children with HOFH will have physical findings. So it will be, you know, so obvious to them that there's something going on with this child, but that's not always the case. And often, um, and I can tell you this from reviewing charts, um, that many healthcare providers fail to take a good family history. And, uh, and then if you have two parents with HEFH, they may be in their 30s, not yet having had a cardiac event. So when the pediatrician says, you know, is there any cardiac disease in your immediate family? The answer may be no. And so the list goes on. Um, so screening would prevent this um, from, uh, you know, prevent us from having to um, go through this. If everybody got screened, um, we would know the answer um, as to whether or not somebody has very elevated cholesterol. Next slide. So what have we learned through the Cascade FH registry and the Family Heart Database? And one of the reasons we do, um, do have this um, Cascade FH registry, and one of the reasons we work with this um, very large uh, national database is to be able to answer questions and to provide um, data so that when the US Preventive Service Task Force says we shouldn't screen, we can provide them with reasons that we should. So we have just submitted a paper to the Journal of the American Heart Association. We submitted it at the end of January. So we're waiting um, for our reviewers comments and hopefully um, to get it published. But this is the largest longitudinal evaluation of people living with HOFH ever published in the United States. We have 67 individuals with HOFH, 16 children and 51 adults. And so um, because it's under review, we can't go into great deal of detail, um, but I'm going to tell you a, a few things. We compare lipids untreated to the time of enrollment to the most recent follow-up in the registry. We describe lipid levels based on the number of lipid altering medications. And I think it's um, intuitively obvious that if people are on more lipid lowering medicines, they're probably going to have a lower LDL. And that is true. We described the burden of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and aortic valve disease in children and adults. And we also looked to our family heart database, which has got about 300 million Americans in it. And we say, um, based on what we know about what a person with HOFH looks like from our registry patients, we can ask how many people in the United States are, um, in our national database that look just like people with HOFH, but maybe haven't been diagnosed. I'd like to just step back a minute for all of you who are on the call tonight that are in the registry. We wanna thank you very much for consenting to be in the registry. And we wanna thank the investigators and coordinators who also make the registry possible. Next slide. So this is a the table from that, um, abstract um, um, poster that we presented. We presented it um, at the American Academy of Pediatrics um, national meeting in um, Anaheim in the um, last fall. And so what I'd like to draw your attention to is, so on the um, left-hand side, we have the kids and on the right-hand side, we have those enrolled as adults. And we can see that at the time of enrollment, um, almost 19% of children already had aortic valve stenosis. 44% of children already had heart disease. The average age of, of onset of heart disease was 8.9 years. Um, for adults, um, about 25% had um, aortic valve stenosis, 78% had uh, cardiac disease as the time of enrollment. And their average age of onset of, of heart disease for adults was 30. So what we're finding um, with children, and we're finding those children who are most um, impacted. And that's good that we're finding these children, but we're missing other children. We know there are other children out there that are not um, being diagnosed. And as you can see, these physical findings um, that the US Preventive Service Task Force will think should be in every child with homozygous FH, no corneal arcus and tendon xanthomas are present only in 56%. So 44% don't have it. Um, and the other thing is I point out, that um, cardiovascular disease history in children, only 37% um, thought that there was a cardiovascular history. Um, you know, we have a lot of fractured families and, um, it, it, and 
and the parents of these children with HOFH are young. Um, so they may not have um, developed cardiac disease yet. Um, there is FH or hypercholesterolemia in 100% of the children and in 98% um, of the adults. Um, so they, there is knowledge that there is um, elevated cholesterol in the family. Next slide. So what have we learned from the Family Heart Database about HOFH? We queried the Family Heart Database looking for individuals, like I said, who look like the HOFH patients, but we wanted to see how do they fare in the real world. And you know, because our paper is still under review, we found around 300 people with LDLs over 400. The age range went from less than 18 to over 60. Many were on no lipid lowering therapy and many had ASCBD already. So these are people in the real world setting that are not getting good care. Next slide. So what are the treatment goals and options for HOFH? So the goals, um, HOFH, HOFH must be treated aggressively upon diagnosis regardless of age. Um, but the earlier we can find it, the better that is. And all FH patients, whether they're HEFH or HOFH, um, are considered high risk. I will say that from the outset, there is a, I've never met a person with HOFH who's been able to be controlled on a single drug. Um, all HOFH patients require combination therapy. And knowing that up front um, sets the stage for knowing that you, know, you may need three or four medicines. Um, for adults um, who have never had cardiovascular disease, so primary prevention, the LDL goal is less than 100. For those with um, ASCBD already, um, so known as secondary prevention, an LDL less than 70. And really, we're learning now more and more that an LDL less than 55. So, Allison, you're one point off. Um, it, 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 it is, is really even better. Um, the pediatric um, lipid treatment goal is less than 130, but lower is better as well. It is important to know um, that you will need to be persistent. Um, most insurance plans cover combination therapy um, when LDL is above treatment goal, but often prior auths are required. And it's sad to say that many times people require multiple um, appeals to get approval. Next slide. So we've come a long way um, from 1973 when we just had bile acid sequestrants. 1987 was a landmark year with the um, advent of statins. Um, lipoprotein apheresis coming 10 years later, also incredibly important for HOFH um, patients. Um, azetamide um, is additive to statins. Lomidipide approved in December of 2012 is an HOFH only drug. Evanuncumab, sorry, evolocumab and alirocumab are PCSK9 inhibitors. Those were approved in 2015, vempidoic acid in 2020. Evanuncumab, an, another game changer, um, approved in 2021 only for HOFH patients um, and uh, in, initially approved at uh, age 12, now looking to get approved at age five. And Inclisiran is a different kind of PCSK9 inhibitor approved in 2021. Next slide. So this is um, an idea of what you might expect um, with, um, with various agents. I can tell you that it's often true that people with HOFH for this set of um, set of medications respond a little less well than what you see here. Um, so don't get the full impact, um, but you know, it, it being on a statin, a zetamide, a PCSK9 inhibitor um, may push uh, people with HOFH to a, a, a better spot and then adding an HOFH medication. Next slide. It may be very helpful. So lipoprotein apheresis, and then um, lipoprotein apheresis can certainly be used for HE and HOFH, um, but lomidipide and even uncumab only approved um, for uh, HOFH, and you know they're very uh, comparable in terms of um, what kind of LDL reduction they can get. Um, and it's important for people to be diagnosed because if they're not diagnosed, they're not going to be approved for these agents. Next slide. 
So um, this is uh, the mechanism of action of lomidopide. Lomidopide is a microsomal triglyceride transfer protein inhibitor. And as what you can see, um, that little circle with the T is a triglyceride rich lipoprotein. And it gets combined um, with ApoB to form something called the VLDL. VLDL is a triglyceride rich lipoprotein, but in the bloodstream, it gets converted to LDL but lomidopide blocks the union of ApoB and this triglyceride rich um, uh, entity. And um, so by doing so, decreases the amount of VLDL. And since VLDL gets converted to LDL, decreases ultimately LDL. But the beautiful thing is that it doesn't require an intact LDL receptor. So whether your LDL receptors are working or not working, um, this drug works. Next slide. And lomidopide, um, as you can see, lowers LDL, lowers total cholesterol, and lowers ApoB, which is the apoprotein associated with LDL. And we see about a 50% about a reduction. Next slide. Even Uncumab also, so the even Uncumab is an ANG PTL3 inhibitor, and it, um, it also um, does not require uh, the um, a, a functioning LDL receptor. So essentially, what um, ANG PTL3 inhibitors, and this one happens to be an antibody to ANG PTL3, um, ANG PTL3 is a um, a protein um, that works to um, inhibit uh, the enzymes that break down VLDL. Uh, but by blocking that um, protein, we see an increased enhancement of VLDL to what's called a VLDL remnant. Now, ultimately, VLDL remnants are converted to LDL. But as you can see, this very thick um, uh, arrow going from the VLDL remnants goes back up to the liver and this removes the VLDL remnants. They don't get converted to LDL. And so this is how ANG-PTL3 not only lowers LD, uh, inhibitors, not only lower LDL, but also lower triglycerides. And um, these drugs work uh, really well. Next slide. Um, this um, just shows you compared to placebo, which is in blue, um, to what we would see very quickly with even Uncumab, you get about a 50% reduction in LDL. And it doesn't matter whether or not you have some functioning LDL receptors or no functioning LDL receptors, you get about the same response. Next slide. Um, lipoprotein apheresis um, is a... a, a, a procedure that physically removes LDL and um, LP little a from the bloodstream. And so um, it has to be done in HOFH every week, um, but sometimes people will stretch it out to every two weeks. And what you're seeing here is you see that there's a baseline LDL on the, the far left-hand side and a, a marked plummeting when this procedure takes place. And I'll show you another slide that shows what the machine looks like, but it physically removes LDL um, and LP little a, but unfortunately LDL rebounds. So over time, there is a time averaged reduction in, um, in LDL. And as you can see, a fairly substantial reduction in LDL from baseline. Um, with lipoprotein apheresis. Next slide. So these are, um, we have a superhero on the right, Aubrey. She's a little girl with HOFH and um, she comes in and gets her treated on a weekly basis to remove LDL from her bloodstream. And then Tom, who is one of our family heart advocates, um, you can really see this uh, lipo absorber machine a little bit um, more closely. And this is basically you remove um, blood from one arm, you separate the red cells from the plasma, you remove the LDL from the plasma, and then you put the red cells back together with the plasma and return the blood to the other arm devoid of um, the LDL and LP little a. Next slide. So I'm gonna take just a minute or two. Um, I think we're in good shape to talk about clinical trials for HOFH. Um, an exciting thing is that Regeneron is seeking approval from the FDA to treat children with HOFH with even Uncumab as early as age five. And um, the 
Uh, FDA has uh, given Regeneron a sort of a fast track for this. Um, current approval is um, ages 12 and up. So I think many parents with children with HOFH will be very pleased um, to know um, that this, this may be possible sometime soon. And AMRIT uh, just announced the results from a lomidopide in children um, studies and kids ages five to 17. So they divided the kids um, five to 10 years old and 11 to 17. And you can see there's a, a, an excellent reduction in LDL, um, comparable or better um, than what is seen in adults. Next slide. And then Arrowhead Pharmaceuticals um, has a study called Gateway. Um, this is an open label study. It's a phase two study. So it's not a phase three, it's, it's a little earlier on. Um, to evaluate the safety and efficacy of Arrow. And this is also another ANG PTL3 inhibitor like even Um uh, but this is a, a small interfering RNA as opposed to an antibody. And um, it is a quarterly injection. Um, so uh, pretty convenient um, four times a year. And then Lib Therapeutics um, is studying a PCSK9 inhibitor. Um, they're looking at comparing um, their 300 milligrams of their lirodalcipib um, uh, versus evolocumab in HOFH patients um, 10 years and older. And these are monthly injections. And this is a, a phase two trial. Next slide. So that, what are our key takeaways? Early aggressive LDL lowering with combination therapy is necessary in HOFH. And the earlier we can diagnose people with HOFH, the sooner they can get started on their way to getting their, their um, LDL under good control. If LDL is over 400, um, people should be thinking of HOFH and we can help you find a specialist and connect um, through the, in the Family Heart Foundation, we have a, a, a care navigator. Um, if you're looking for a specialist in your um, area, we can help you. Next slide. So I think we're gonna stop here and answer some questions. And then I think Allison will have um, some slides uh, to end with. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. McGowan. That was fantastic information. And um, I'll remind everybody here that the uh, this webinar is being recorded. So we can, you can go back and watch it later because uh, there's a lot of great information there. So feel free to continue to put questions in the Q&A or excuse me, yes, in the Q&A and we'll be happy to address those. So, um, one question, Dr. McGowan, you talked about the different mechanisms that can lead to uh, elevated cholesterol levels. How do you know which drug to start with if you're trying to address super high cholesterol? Yeah, so there, there's generally a standard um, procession of medications. So um, we typically start with a statin. Um, so in, in, in um, the setting of very high LDL cholesterol, where we think it's HEFH or HOFH, um, the current recommendation from the, um, our guidelines, uh, it would be high dose of high intensity statins. So 20 or 40 milligrams of rosuvastatin, 40 or 80 milligrams of atorvastatin. Now that doesn't mean if somebody doesn't tolerate that highest dose that they wouldn't get benefit from a lower dose, but that's, we start with the higher dose. And then if we need more therapy, we would add azetamibe. So both statins and azetamibe are generic. And um, so they're very cost-effective. And then the next step would be a PCSK9 inhibitor. And then if there's, you know, we think somebody has HOFH, that's when we would begin um, using the HOFH drugs. Um, Bempidoic acid is another option. It's approved in um, heterozygous FH, um, but people are, I'm sure, using it in, in homozygous, uh, potentially using it in homozygous FH as well. And then um, bile acid sequesterants are sometimes used as, as well. And what we know from the registry is, um, that it is not uncommon for people with HOFH to be on the full gamut of all of those medicines. Mm -hmm. And I know we hear this from parents a lot. Um, and when you're dealing with HOFH, I think a lot of times the threat or the, the fear of, of a major event happening is the, the prevalent fear. But should parents be concerned about any side effects, potential adverse effects of starting children on medication pretty young? So I, I think you always have to worry about um, side effects of medications, but the, um, the risk associated with not treating with homozygous FH is so great um, that um, it, it, 
I, I think that parents, you know, I, I, being a parent myself, I, I can certainly sympathize, um, but it is really important to initiate the therapies. Um, you know, if there is a side effect, um, these, these therapies can be stopped, but um, I, I think it, it is really crucial to try to um, get your child's uh, LDL um, to as low as humanly possible if they've been diagnosed with HOFH. Mm -hmm. Do you have advice for um, anyone who either thinks that the child may, might be at risk or feels that their own condition could potentially be undiagnosed or misdiagnosed for how to approach a, a healthcare provider for further testing or to learn more, you know, to investigate further this possibility? Yeah, that's a, a great question, Allison. I, I think that um, one of the things that we have learned um, through a lot of work with uh, in NIH grants on um, screening and um, uh, identification is unfortunately many healthcare providers are not well aware of homozygous FH. And so I think the most important thing would be to find your way to a specialist if you think that you have HOFH. And we have a, a map from across the entire country and we are more than happy to um, link somebody. Um, our care navigator can also help a person um, you know, with, with you know, things that they should say. Um, and one of, one of the things that you can request um, is you could request genetic testing. There are a large number of um, genetic testing uh, labs um, that are available and most hospitals do have some relationship with um, a, a lab, but it does, it, or, um, a, a hospital might have a genetic counselor um, and that might be the way, the path um, to making a diagnosis, seeing a genetic counselor who will um, in general be much more versed in HOFH than many primary care providers. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the care navigation um, mm -hmm. functionality on the Family Heart website is a great resource and I'm glad you mentioned that. But if someone is looking for a specialist, I think, you know, over the course of my life, I've seen a lot of different kinds of specialists. What kind of specialists should someone try to be reaching out to? Maybe what is their first stop in the specialist group? Yeah, um, so I, I, I think if you can find a lipid specialist, someone who's um, board certified in, in lipid metabolism, um, that would be great. Um, so that would be somebody who's, you know, taken the lipid boards um, through the National Lipid Association. Cardiologists, um, preventive cardiologists would tend to have an interest. Endocrinologists, um, uh, you know, specific endocrinologists um, may have a, an interest in lipid metabolism. And so those would be the, the first stops um, that I, I would recommend. Mm -hmm. And then this may be um, our last question, unless anybody wants to add another one, but I know, and I sort of mentioned in the opening why the specific diagnosis mattered to me personally. Um, but why do you, as a, as a physician, why do you think it matters to have this HOFH diagnosis? I, I think that in your case, Allison, it opened doors to medications that you would not otherwise have gotten. And these new medicines have really revolutionized care for people with HOFH. It also helps people understand that um, if, you know, in terms of family planning, that um, if you have HOFH, each one of your children um, is, is going to have HEFH at, at, at the very least. And it would make you want to know, you know what your partner's um, status is as well. Um, so it's, it's the eyes wide open. Um, I think for you, you probably often wonder why am I singled out among my siblings? You know, why is my LDL twice, you know, my brother or sisters? And so it, I think it kind of also helps people say, this is not my fault. This is, this is genetics. And it's, you know, I, I cannot even tell you how many patients with HEFH and HOFH have endured um, physicians saying things to them like, what do you eat? And like just really condescending things. This really helps somebody understand that this is my genetics. I mean, it, it is not my fault, um, but it's something I can work to take control. Like you said, you were, wanted to work to take control of it. Mm -hmm. Great. And we did have one more question that I think just kind of will we'll tie us up here because tonight we've obviously been focused on homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, but there are other 
um, contributors to heart disease. So someone is asking about the Family Heart Foundation and um, research into LP little a, which um, has been something I know that, that um, the foundation is working for as well, but I'll let you maybe address sort of the role of LPA um, outside of HOFH. Yeah, a, a little over a year ago, we changed our name from the um, Familial Hypercholesterolemia Foundation to the much more um, pronounceable Family Heart Foundation, but we did it as we um, expanded our mission uh, to lipoprotein little a. And LP little a is um, incredibly underdiagnosed. Um, we've done a fair amount of research and we're continuing to do more. Um, we know that uh, less than 1% of individuals in the United States have had their LP little a checked, um, but we believe that everybody should have their LP little a evaluated. Um, we are heartened um, that there are um, medications in clinical trials now um, that um, if, if they prove safe and effective, um, we will have LP little a lowering medications in the future. But if somebody has a high LP little a right now, what we need to do is lower all their other risk factors um, to reduce their cardiovascular risk because LP little a is quite a powerful um, risk factor for both atherosclerosis and thrombosis um, clotting. And, and so um, we aggressively treat LDL and uh, all other risk factors in somebody that has elevated lipoprotein little a. We do, um, th th there is evidence that people with FH are more likely to have a high LP little a. Um, it used to be said 50% of people have a high LP little a if they have FH. It's probably somewhere between 30 and 50%. And then in the general population, about 20% of people have an elevated LP little a. Great. Yeah, thank you. That's um, great to see the expansion of the mission to include LP little a as well. So thank you so much, Dr. McGowan. In our last four minutes, I um, will put the slides back up just to share some resources with folks um, where you can go to follow up on tonight's uh, webinar get it is being recorded so that will be posted so that you can see that but if you'll see on the next slide um, there are resources available for those who are interested in learning more or sharing more about homozygous FH so there is an infographic sort of explaining what it is also uh, next steps of this is what you can expect with treatments as Dr. McGowan talked about where we start with statins and adding azetamibe and it sort of shows you the path through the various treatments available for HOFH on the next slide, you'll see that the Family Heart uh, Group Foundation is also participating in continuing med medical education to help make sure that healthcare providers are educated on this topic. Uh, we've talked a lot tonight about how a lot of people are not aware. Um, so it's a big part of the mission of just driving awareness. And this is one way that we do that as well. On the next slide, um, we've talked also about clinical trials and there is information out there on federal government websites, but the Family Heart web page makes it very easy to find clinical trials that are specific to familial hypercholesterolemia and uh, elevated LP little a. So I would encourage you, like I said, I've, I've been in a number of trials. It's been one of the things that I feel most empowered um, when I participate in because I'm participating in finding treatments and, and helping everyone with this. So it's a great resource to be able to sort of cut through a lot of the uh, information that can be overwhelming on federal uh, websites. Um, on the next slide as well, um, the care navigation system, our center that we mentioned. This is a fantastic resource to come to. Let Family Heart know what kind of help you need. Are you trying to find a specialist? Do you need help speaking to families, speaking to providers? Um, there's an extensive amount of information and ways that you can talk to a real person who can help guide you through this and just really, again, help you make sense of what can be a very complicated and disparate set of information. So I'd encourage you if you're looking for assistance with finding appropriate care to visit that. It is really a wonderful, wonderful resource. Um, the next slide. So if you are a patient or a caregiver or someone interested in supporting this community, I would really encourage you to look into becoming an advocate. That's where I first got involved with Family Heart was as an advocate for awareness. Um, lots of beautiful people in this picture that have become good friends of mine. We have a new class every year, and these are the folks who are sharing their stories, who are on the ground, you know, the boots on the ground, the grassroots group, raising awareness and um, sharing their stories. So um, there's information on the website about being an advocate for awareness that I hope that you will consider. Uh, on the next slide, um, all that we have done here, and this is just a small sliver of what the Family Heart Foundation is working on, um, is made possible through the generosity of donations. So if um, 
If you have been helped by this, if you want to help with the mission, I would encourage you to donate, um, donate your time, donate resources. Um, we've made tremendous progress uh, in the last decade and it's been really exciting to be a part of that and would love to have you support us and participate with us on this journey. So um, that is it for tonight, Dr. McGowan. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining us. It was good to see names I know and to see new names as well. So appreciate it very much. And we'll look forward to seeing you on the next webinar with Family Heart.